Hello and welcome back to the Food Tribe podcast. I am Food Tribe editor Rachel Hogg and my guest today is probably my most well-travelled guest so far, having visited more than a hundred countries. She's worked at some amazing world-famous restaurants, written cookbooks, recently launched a Korean fried chicken restaurant in London. She splits her time between the UK, the US and Asia and somehow also still finds time to appear on countless TV shows as both a judge and guest chef. I've been joined today by the fabulous and very glamorous Judy Ju. Hey Judy. Hi, how are you? Thank you I'm for having me. Good. Thank you. It's fabulous to have you here. Thank you so much for popping along for a chat. Um, I was obviously already very familiar with your work and your cooking, um, but was very recently asked to join in a little competition set by Kia, the car company, um, to cook one or two recipes from Judy's book, um, Korean Food Made Simple. Um, and then we have to post them online um, to help celebrate Halal, which I might have pronounced terribly. I'm not sure. Um, and yep, so that's Hola, the, yeah, okay. fine. <laughs> which is the Lunar New Year. Um, and I may have got a little bit carried away and ended up doing five or six things because everything in the book is so delicious. Um, and yes, yeah, she's joined us all the way from New York City. Um, it's quite early in the morning there and it's still just about before lunch for me. So it's another podcast with no glass of wine on the go, which is my usual go to. <laughs> Well, you know, you, you you could just, you know, go for it before lunch. Yeah, it's just, just on the <laughs> I mean, lockdown life does require such things, so. That is very true. That is very mechanisms. true. <laughs> <laughs> so, Judy, I'm so interested. You've done so much. Um, I'm so interested to know how you went from industrial engineering and operations research degree to then banking and then to becoming a chef. I, um grew up with a very typical tiger parent upbringing. So, you know, uh, my parents were very much um, trying to uh, curate my life a bit as every kind of tiger parent does with, you know, all the piano lessons and music lessons, et cetera. And then, um, you know, being a chef wasn't really in their vocabulary. And, you know, I was being groomed to go to certain schools and have a certain type of career. You know, I was really being set to become a doctor like, like my father, but, um, I, I had no interest in it. Um, I did manage to go to engineering school. So I, I went into the sciences, you know, my, but both my parents are in the sciences. My mom's also a chemist and then, uh, or was a chemist back then. And um, so I really didn't know anything else. And then went to school in New York City, uh, where I am now and uh, majored in engineering and decided that I wasn't smart enough to be an engineer at all. <laughs> like I was like barely getting by in school. <laughs> And, and so I uh, was uh, really looking to see what else I could do. And being in New York, you you really, and back then also, you know, this is um, like kind of Wolf of Wall Street days when, you know, Solomon Brothers, Lehman Brothers, Barristerns, they were all still open and, uh, you know, it was it was uh, it was a great time in finance. So um, you couldn't help but um, kind of feel that pull of Wall Street from, um, going to school in New York. So I ended up going into finance and worked at um, Morgan Stanley for about five years um, doing fixed income derivatives. And I, uh, I loved it for, for the time being, um, but I didn't have a passion for it. And over the time I, I grew somewhat, um, you know, uh, just, 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 just disenfranchised with, 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 with the whole industry. I was like, you know, I don't love this. I don't, you know, I love some of the people I work with. I love learning, but I don't have a passion for finance. Like I, I wasn't driven um, or like genuinely interested in it. I didn't want to read about it in my free time. I always was picking up cookbooks or cooking magazines or, um, you know, reading um, like the latest um, trends in, in, in restaurants. You know, back then there was a guy called Zagat's. And so I was always looking at Zagat's and um, I, I, I just kind of came to like, a, a, a crossroads and had this epiphany and I was really not liking my, my, my job and I decided to quit and I went to cooking school here in New York at the French Culinary Institute now known as the International Culinary Center and I never looked back <laughs> I never really thought it would lead to what I'm doing now but I um 
I, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, you know, have books, I have shows, um, I write a lot, um, you know, just launched a new fast casual concept called Soulbird in London in the Westfield Mall, opening up another location um, in June as well. And mm -hmm. yeah, so we'll see what happens. That's so good. And um, what was your time like at the French Culinary Institute? And you went straight from there to Saveur magazine, didn't you? Yes. Like how, how was working for one of the biggest food mags in the US? Oh gosh. Um, well, I loved, loved cooking school. It was so much fun. Um, and I, I had the best time. I mean, <laughs> I think it was one of my favorite times of, um, cause I, you know, like, I think like going back to school when, when you're older, um, you actually appreciate it more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I get that. <laughs> um, and, and you're just like, and I also, I went to cooking school for patisserie arts, you know, so I was making literally every cookies and stuff and using like my, my science background and my chemistry knowledge to to apply to the kitchen so I absolutely loved it plus plus the creative element you know particularly in pastry it's all about decorating and making flowers and piping work etc and um so I, I had the best time and um and 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 I did well and um and then I went to I worked at Slow Food USA as well as Sever magazine and this is back when Sever was you know, a really high-end aficionado National Geographic of Food type magazine when Coleman Andrews, the founder and editor-in-chief, was involved. So that was really the, the glory days of Sever. And I loved it because I was learning so much and I was learning about new cultures and new countries and traveling the world through the lens of food and researching the history of different countries through, through, through their food. You know, because food really tells a story of a country. It tells a story of feast and famine and occupation spice and trade routes and um you know uh, yeah uh, colonization everything um it's all seen through the food and, and the food was influenced through all of these things incredible and yeah. um, you've also worked at loads of restaurants in the uk um you've worked at a lot of gordon ramsay's restaurants um, have you got a favorite of his that you worked at and why um yeah i mean i worked um for Marcus Waring's restaurant back then. I think it was, I think it was at, um, where was he? Marcus Waring, was was that Mark, was it Mark? I can't, oh God, so long ago. <laughs> um, when it was Marcus Waring at, I can't, well, anyway, when he was still part of um, the empire, mm -hmm. um, I worked there for a bit and I really got to, um, uh, I didn't work with Marcus too much, but I got to work with Chantal Nicholson, who mm -hmm. is amazing. I absolutely love her and she's, so incredibly inspirational and such a wonderful person also and she's so incredibly passionate for for what she does and she's detail oriented and meticulous and such a great mentor and teacher i still look up to her to this day and what she's doing in in the realm of sustainability i think is extremely important and admirable during this time as well 100 yeah. um, percent. and on top of all of those places then you've also spent time at the French Laundry, the Fat Duck, and were you exec chef at the Playboy Club as well? Yes, that yeah. must have been an experience. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it's so funny because um, I thought long and hard about that job role because obviously it's the Playboy Club and has all kinds of you know like stigma against it, etc. And and I do consider myself a feminist and, and, and for women's rights. And um, you know, I was like, do I want to work for for Playboy? But um, you know, Playboy really isn't anything bad in yeah. the 21st century. I mean, you know, it's quite coquettish and nostalgic and um, and they went under, you know, like, like the magazine and everything like went bankrupt because they couldn't compete because they're not racy enough. They weren't dirty enough and hardcore enough, you know what I mean? So they're actually like, like I, I swear to God, like, like the bunnies, you know, weren't even like I wear less clothes on the beach, <laughs> literally. Then, then the the bunnies are in 1970s style one pieces, you yeah. know, and two stockings, and nothing's high cut, and everything is, you know, uh, like 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 you know, it's it's all very well covered, you know, and um, and nowadays like music videos or advertising and fashion advertising and perfume ads, I they're all more racy than anything that that the playboy was was really doing you know so um 
I, I decided to 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 join. And also, I have to say that you have to look at the fun factor in life completely also, when you do things. <laughs> and I, you know, it's really interesting because I had the best time. But there is a certain allure or like a. I don't know, a mystique about the Playboy brand, because I can't even tell you how many of my high powered partner at law firms, partners at hedge funds, whatever friends were begging me for a bunny costume, <laughs> begging me for, for a bunny costume. You know, they're like, I want a real bunny costume. I mean, no, no matter who you are or like how many accolades you had, there's just something about fun for Halloween to dress up as as the bunny, you know, kind of like the L Woods and um, and Clueless or something. <laughs> and um, I don't know, there's just like this like mystique about it. So um, I, I had a great time, and also I really studied the brand too. You know, Playboy is one of the super brands of the world, or there are only a handful of them. You know, up there with, and Coca Cola and Playboy. Um, I, I I forget the others, um, but there are only like five that where that little logo, no matter what it is, is recognized all around the world. Doesn't matter what continent you're in, and the fact that Hugh Hefner built that in one generation, in one lifetime, is actually quite remarkable. And he was also quite a pioneer. He was the first um, person to ever put a black person on the cover of a magazine in the United States. He was the first person to ever give um, gay, um, gay uh, employees um, equal rights in terms of pension and benefits and healthcare, et cetera. So he was always a champion for the underdog and minorities. And, um, and I think that's something that um, sometimes gets forgotten with all of the noise around the feminist you know, criticism, yeah. And that's the thing, like you said, it's it's an experience, isn't it? And all the fun that you had while you were there, like it's totally yeah. worth it. Yeah, yeah. I had, I, I mean, I went to the parties in LA at the Playboy Mansion while Huff was still alive. And these are the, you know, that's bucket list stuff. You know, I spent New Year's Eve there. What? You know? And yeah, I mean, and so and brought like a bunch of my friends. You know, this is this is life is about experiences, and um, I. I had the best time and I got to spend some quality time with Hef also but before he died, which was, you know, he's so incredibly impressive. And even in his old age, he never lost a beat and um, incredibly smart. Like he just had such an aura about him that, um, you know, it was just a genius, really. I mean, anybody can that can build a brand like that um, at that time um, globally and, and did incredibly well was 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 really um, quite a visionary, yeah. I love that you spent New Year's Eve at the Playboy Mansion. <laughs> That's not something I expected to learn during this. <laughs> many, I, I, I've been there so many times. It's so fun, yeah, yeah. I always remember um because I used to be obsessed with cribs um when yeah. I was a teenager and stuff and I always remember when they did the tour of the Playboy Mansion and yeah and everything Big and beautiful <laughs> uh, had that like exotic zoo with all the animals and um the grotto and then the game room and the yeah it's a beautiful property yeah <laughs> amazing um, and on a completely different note, um, you like you mentioned before that you have now learned Soulbird, uh, Soulbird in um, Westfield. Um, how's that going? I mean, I feel that yeah. Korean fried chicken just needs to be absolutely everywhere. It's so wonderful. And um, what makes what so makes good. Korean fried chicken so good? Um, yeah, so I, I uh, opened up Soulbird in August in the middle of the pandemic, and we, wow. we closed it down three times due to government regulations, but we will be reopening when we can on May 17th, Amazing. and we're opening up another location in Canary Wharf on June 1st, so stay tuned to hear more details about that. And um, yeah, the uh, USP is Korean fried chicken. It's the better KFC, if you will. And uh, the two things that make Korean fried chicken different and better than any other fried chicken in the world, I would say, number one is that extra hard, cracking, crunchy crust. It's double fried and um, it uh, is known to have a very, very thin um, crust, which is what makes it so addictive. And also the sauces. So um, Korean fried chicken is, is usually um, 
it comes drizzled and tossed in different sauces. We serve ours on the side because we want people to be able to pick and choose, et cetera. But the sauces are really what make it so incredibly addictive. And um, of course, the sauces are made with really typical um, Korean aromatics and ingredients like gochujang and garlic and soy and ginger. So um, finger looking good, if I can steal their tagline. <laughs> Amazing, I think you can. Um, yeah, the, yeah, the gochujang sauce um, from your book is just, it is addictive. It took oh. me back to Seoul and just, oh. just being on the streets kind of tucking into the Korean fried chicken oh, stuff is oh, incredible. Um, and you've, you've done a lot of food tours around um, South Korea. What would you say are some of the most interesting dishes that you've tried while traveling in South Korea? Oh gosh, I mean, whenever I go to Korea, I, I try something that I've never seen before every single time. The, 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 the depth and breadth of what they harvest there truly is incredible. Um, it's a peninsula, you know, so they harvest everything from the sea. It's very mountainous. So you have mountain vegetables and root vegetables, valleys, fields, everything. And um, Koreans do eat absolutely everything. Um, I would say the most interesting thing have to be some of the vegetables. You know, Korea has a history of Buddhism, so vegetarianism and vegan cuisine is, is very much ingrained in the culture. And because of that, um, yields a grand bounty of um, things that are, are harvested from, from the earth. And, you know, just, just something like, like, like the lotus plant, you know, we eat the, the, the leaves, we eat the bulb, we eat the flower, we eat the root, you know, absolutely everything. And it's something that's so beautiful um, and it tastes so delicious and has wonderful textures and it's visually stunning. Um, also many different kinds of ferns and bracken roots um, and, uh, you know, medicinal um, things that date back to oriental medicine, such as ginseng is also really, really wonderful. All the different types of honeys that I've tasted are, are gorgeous and um you know ridiculously fragrant as well um yeah i just i just love it all and um all different types of of leaves and um you know even even just like um you know the sesame seed and the mm -hmm. plant like like we eat the entire thing we eat the oil the seeds the plant and um, the root and um it's it's just um it's so incredibly interesting to eat um all over korea because obviously they're regional specialties mm -hmm. and you can go um, to the bamboo forest, eat bamboo and eat things that are cooked and steamed in bamboo, salts that's been roasted in bamboo and takes on, you know, that, that woody, greeny um, fragrance. It, it's absolutely lovely. So, yeah. Wow. And then what does, what does home cooking look like in Korea? Like what would be a traditional dish that your parents would cook for you like as a child in Korea? Uh, Gosh, oh, as a child, I mean, um, I mean, always rice, mm -hmm. uh, but but fortified rice, you know, it's not uncommon in Korea to have rice mixed with lots of different things, like as many as 24 different grains and pulses and beans. Wow. It's, it's really um, good for you. So lots of ancient grains, barley, seeds, amaranth, um, sesame, um, beans, lentils, etc. Brown rice, um, all, all different things mixed in. Um, and, um, and of course, kimchi, kimchi is always on the table, 365 days a year, um, you know, every single meal. And when I was little, my mom used to just wash it off so it wasn't that spicy, so she just kind of rinsed it in, in water. And so I just have like little crunchy pickles to eat. And uh, my afternoon, my after school snack was actually just like a bowl of, of, of um, water with rice, so like porridge kind of, and that, that, was, that was warm. And I used to eat that with um, some washed off kimchi and spam. <laughs> you know, Korea's oh, like okay. spam, you know, <laughs> and um, I grew up eating spam. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's like a real thing. And it's considered like a luxury item in Korea. And um, okay. because, I did yeah. not know that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You can, I've written many articles about Korea's obsession with spam. So anywhere you have um, a history of war and you have an army base, you have a tradition of canned and tinned meats. And so spam is very prevalent in Hawaii, very prevalent in Korea, um, Okinawa, Japan, you know, so it's, it's, um, has a lot of history and it's stuck with with a vengeance and it goes extremely well with kimchi <laughs> so okay, i'm gonna have to try that i've hundred yeah. i've only ever tried spam once um so uh, the founder of food tribe james may um he he made me 
eat some spam um for the first yeah. time a while ago but with beans so I'm gonna have to try it with kimchi oh, yeah. I think that could be kimchi. a game changer yeah so <laughs> just just with some rice a fried egg some fried spam and kimchi it is so good it is really 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 good yeah so I that was breakfast you. like yeah <laughs> that, that was my typical breakfast met many times yeah right that's my weekend plan sorted <laughs> If you have to fry it and you slice it like a, a bit thin so it gets like kind of crispy yeah okay I'll, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll reserve judgment yeah. <laughs> and um you've you've been to more than 100 countries um I have no idea if you'll be able to answer this but which was the most memorable food wise and what were some of the best food experiences you've had around oh, the world gosh. or the worst that might be easier <laughs> yeah um I mean a hundred countries also includes like the islands, you know yeah. what I mean? Like every, so it's like, you know, and you know, Vatican city and places like this, you know, so, it counts, it counts. <laughs> San Marino. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, um, I would say, I mean, some of the best meals, um, I've had in Italy just on like a seaside shack, no name, just mom and pop cooking, whatever they catch just kissed with a bit of lemon and a little drizzle of the best olive oil from the region and, you know, local wine. I mean, that that to me is, is just heaven. Um, also in Japan, I've had some beautiful meals just in Skiji market, you know, sushi, like sushi at five in the morning, so incredibly fresh, perfect rice. It's just, it's just beautiful. Um, I've had incredible meals, obviously in Korea also, uh, but again, like, like, you know, just at a shack, next to a rice paddy in the middle of the countryside where just like one lady is the waitress, she's the chef, she's the, you know, she's she's everything. It's just like one old lady working there and that's it. She takes your order, she walks away, she makes it, she delivers it. it it's it's incredible, uh, wow. you know, the most gorgeous um, meals. And um, and uh, I don't know, God, there, there, there's so many places that I absolutely love to eat and then you can go obviously to the high-end spectrum and, mm -hmm. and start talking about like all the fancy michelin star dining experiences and like san sebastian and and also italy and 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 japan and korea etc um and uh let me see places where i i've struggled with with food um i would say um maybe uh maybe some countries in the Eastern Bloc, I don't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, yep. and some of the countries in Central America. Um, yeah, where it's just kind of like rice and beans and, and, you know, and ceviche, which is beautiful ceviche, but after you've had ceviche for like 20 days or like however long you're there, you're like, I need something else. And it's just like rice and beans, <laughs> and, um, which is delicious, but then you kind of like start craving other things and um you've you've done countless mm -hmm. tv shows over the years so both as a judge and competing on things like iron chef and um, what are some of the secrets behind making a cooking show or consequently judging a food show so for instance yeah. i only found out quite recently that the food that they eat on master chef when they're judging is usually stone cold because obviously it takes kind of a oh, while yeah. to put everything together so i'm just really intrigued how what your experiences have been like kind of being in food media yeah um yeah you eat a lot of cold food you eat a lot of food that is undercooked um and questionable you eat a lot of food that tastes awful depending on the show um and yeah because i mean i would have to say that i've been lucky that most of the food shows that i've judged have have put out amazing food and really good food but um you know, it's cooking under ridiculous circumstances, you know, and not under normal circumstances. And usually with, you know, um, absurd ingredients and, you know, so um, you're going to get weird stuff. You know, I've, I mean, I've eaten um, like, what do you call um, gastrique sauces made of gummy bears, you know, <laughs> and like, mm. it's candy or like things cooked with Skittles, you know, and, or something. And I'm watching like chefs, like, take out and pick only the yellow ones because they're trying to get the lemon and all the other flavors are weird, you know, <laughs> like the lemon <laughs> lime ones, you know, <laughs> and, um, and uh, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's so much easier to judge, obviously, because you just sit there and eat to come up with like, you know, witty commentary, which uh, is, is pretty easy uh, to cook in such conditions is definitely stressful. 
yeah yes we've um we've done bits and bobs um in james may's bunker kitchen which is basically just an underground windowless room which has like a cooking desk and an induction hob on it and that's basically it like no hot running water or anything and again I think people are just like oh why aren't you creating like a three-course masterpiece there it's like you try you try cooking in that kitchen <laughs> like seriously oh, yeah definitely. beans on toast is about the most you can find <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, you know people have to remember too that these are all studio kitchens like you know nothing works well Yes. Like, uh, you know, so like the blast chiller isn't cold enough, the, the hobs aren't hot enough, you know, the, the water, you have to pump it with a with a pedal on the floor sometimes, you know, because it's not, it's, it's, a, it's a set, you know, and it, it doesn't work. And um, yeah, it's, it's just a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> but good fun, though. <laughs> It is, it is, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I've just got a few um, quick fire questions, which I'd love to ask. Um, so would you say that you have a signature dish? I'm assuming probably Korean fried chicken, but I may be wrong. Korean fried chicken. Yeah. Yeah, Korean fried chicken. Also, my, my kimchi is very good. Like, I, I make really good kimchi, yeah. Amazing. Do you sell your kimchi anywhere, or have you just... I don't, I don't, but I should, because everybody, like begs me for it whatever <laughs> yeah. it is amazing um um what kitchen gadgets could you not live without um my microplane um rasp uh grater and um i use my vitamix blender quite a bit also mm -hmm. yeah amazing. um what's your favorite quick and easy meal instant ramen noodles do you pimp them? Do you add anything or do you just go straight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I always add an egg. Uh, sometimes that's all I have, <laughs> but I always add vegetables, spinach or, um, you know, scallions, spring onions, um, crab sticks, whatever I have in the fridge or freezer, but always like at least two eggs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, what's your ultimate comfort food? Oh gosh, there's a, a silken tofu soup called sundubu jjigae, which I love and I'm known to be addicted to. Whenever I go to Korea, it's the first meal that I want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a favorite takeaway or do you ever indulge in junk food? Oh yeah, completely. Um, I'm obsessed with Chinese American food. You can't get it anywhere outside America. So it's things like chicken with broccoli and, and um, like egg foo young and, and lo mein and tabushu pork and but I'm particularly obsessed with egg rolls yeah so I love egg rolls you can you can't get them anywhere outside America yeah yeah I have not it's a good point I've never I've never seen them anywhere outside yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a Chinese American thing yeah mm -hmm. and um which other restaurants and chefs do you um kind of enjoy going to and really admire their work um, well, Chantal Nicholson, I, I already mentioned her. I, I think her food is brilliant, particularly what she's doing with around plant-based food. Um, I uh, can I talk like globally, or is it? Yeah, global is good. Yeah, in London. Okay. Um, I also um, I really like. Um, I'm really good friends with another Korean American chef named Esther um, Choi. She has mock bar here in New York, and I'm kind of her her mentor, and so but she's um, doing great things on the Korean food scene also. Um, I also um, am good friends with uh, Asma Khan in London, and I think um, her, her voice is very much uh, important in terms of how she's um, standing up for all of like women in kitchens and, um, and, her, and her kitchen is just amazing. Um, and she's putting out some amazing, delicious food there at Darjeeling Express. And um, gosh, where else? Uh, I mean, there's there's so many. <laughs> I can't even. Sorry, it's a bit of a mean one. <laughs> uh, I know, no, it's, um, I also, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, there's so many um, restaurateurs that I look up to also. Um, you know, I just had lunch with Drew near, near Parant, um, who's the owner of Nobu. And what he's been able to create is incredible. Um, you know, a testament of, of, uh, of, of who he is and, and his, uh, his, his talent um, and all the, restaurant that he, all the restaurants that he's owned over the years. Um, I've had some excellent meals too here when I, when I, when I uh, during my time in New York. Um, and uh, it's, it's an interesting time during COVID because hospitality has been hit so incredibly hard. So um, anybody that's been able to, to survive really needs everyone's help right now. So I think the whole, you know, eat out to help out means more than, than anything right now. And I've been doing my part definitely here in New York. And um, 
it's hard. It's really hard. Um, even the, those who've managed to stay open for just delivery. I mean, it's really hard to make ends meet. And um, so I think I'm just like tipping my hat to the entire restaurant industry and and because um, it's so incredibly hard and we all just have to stick together and support each other. Um, and particularly all of the um, kind of like big stalwarts in, 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 in the London dining scene, like people like Marcus or Claude Bossy or, or Jason Atherton. And, um, you know, all, all of these um, people are, are, are um, uh, you know, really um, pillars. And so we have to kind of support them to, to be able to you know, bring back that, that dining scene to where it was before COVID and even stronger. I know I'm very much counting down the days until restaurants open again here I'm just going to be oh honest. yeah mm, definitely yeah, yeah. and I, I didn't know that um everywhere would open up again in New York so that's yeah it's great uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah New York New York was never in full lockdown you know oh, okay. um, so all the stores are open um outdoor dining is always open and what uh, restaurants have become very creative here I mean everybody's had to pivot and evolve and everybody has like outdoor bungalows and some of them are extremely nice they call them chalets and they have wallpaper and real furniture and stuff and um, and indoor dining is now open to 50 percent capacity so it's fantastic yeah I loved um, when the mayor put in the rule about um, having to serve a substantial meal or anything with a drink in bars and the yeah. kind of creativity that some of the bars yeah. were showing in terms of like you got like four chips like with your with your drink yeah. and stuff to kind of get around the rules. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think yeah. like just the way that the industry has managed to adapt and try new things and stuff has been incredible. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you're having to think outside the box and, um, you know, even with, with my own restaurants, um, you know, we are really focusing on marketing and coming up with brand collaborations and trying to hook up with lifestyle, et cetera, just to kind of get um, our brand awareness out there. And um, yeah, I think that everyone is trying to do so right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And obviously you've just mentioned a lot of incredible chefs. Um, have you read any good cookbooks recently? Yeah, actually, I just read one the, the other day. I was asked to write an endorsement quote for the back of the of the book, and um, it's called "Cooking with Clara," and it's by Clara Melchiori, who actually just passed this past October, bless her heart. Um, but she comes from a very um, well-known Italian uh, family in Chicago who is behind the Celeste frozen pizza, which is a big frozen pizza brand in the States called Celeste. So that was her mother. Um, so Clara obviously took um, on this like very big food um, tradition and um, they own restaurants in, in Chicago and all of uh, um, Southern Italian cuisine. And she wrote a cookbook in the last six months before she passed away. But the cookbook is more of a memoir. And after you read it, you really feel like you know her and her family. And it's full of all um, really kind of cute anecdotes and it's, it's just full of love and memories. And I really enjoyed reading it. And every single recipe has a story um, and, and the head note, you know, it's like, oh, you know, like uh, this was Uncle Gino's favorite. He used to eat it every Fridays when he came in. So it seems so incredibly personal and an intimate look into her life. That sounds absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, I hope we can get it it in the yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's your favorite drink? Um, alcoholic or not? Alcohol. either depending on depending uh, okay <laughs> gosh I'm not alcoholic I'm addicted to coconut water mm -hmm. and here I've been drinking this brand called harmless harvest it's organic and um, it's free trade so it's it's good for the world and the planet too and it's pink um, but it's the most delicious coconut water ever I love it um, and then um, alcoholic I've been um, really into gin lately nice. and drinking a lot of gins um, and uh yeah, just trying all, all different kinds um, from, from all around the world and um, just, yeah, gin, gin and tonics. Have you got a favorite gin brand? Um, I mean, I do like Monkey. Um, I also, uh, I mean, I tried one from the Isle of Wight. I forget the name, um, which was really good too. Was it Mermaid um, Gin? Yes, it was Mermaid. Yes, <laughs> beautiful green, green bottle. Yes, it was Mermaid. Um, so that was delicious also. Um, yeah, yeah. Fabulous. And um, so as is customary at the end of the Food Tribe podcast, we always have to ask, what is your favorite cheese? Oh, goat cheese. I'm obsessed 
with goat cheese and like the goatier the better <laughs> i like it like like bawling at me or neighing at me whatever sounds good to me, but like funky yeah and um i love love goat cheese i can just i can eat it like like straight i don't eat crackers or anything just like huge amounts of goat cheese yeah and here's the thing with the goatiness and the farminess i think that puts a lot of people off but that just gets me like right in there i'm just yeah like, yeah I mean, I love kimchi. Uh, anything funky I love, like kimchi, goat cheese, blue cheese, uni. Um, I mean, like, yeah, like anything stinky is just like yummy to me. I don't know. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and ending on that nice farmy goaty note, um, yeah. that is all we have time for this week. So right. thank you so much to Judy for the wonderful chat. And we will see yeah. everyone else again next week for another episode of the Food Tribe podcast. <laughs>